Our text for this morning is John chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 12. John 8 and verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came and whither I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy father? Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. If ye had known me, you should have known my father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. John records the mounting tension between the religious leaders and Jesus. Back and forth, there's an exchange between these Pharisees, these scribes, and the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of this, Jesus continues his messianic ministry. He's offering himself as Savior and Lord. He's claiming and proving his deity. He's inviting faith and submission to his lordship. But not on man's terms. He exposes error. He sets people free. He addresses sin. He grants forgiveness. And he can only do this because he is who he claims to be. He is the eternal Son of God. We have before us in verse number 12, the second of seven I am's, seven specific I am's in the gospel record of John. This one is, I am the light of the world. The question that we must study out is, what does he mean? What does he claim for himself in this statement? What does Jesus claim for himself? Well, in the context of the Gospel of John, we know the theme of John's Gospel record, the theme of John's gospel record is that Jesus is the I am. He is God's answer to man's deepest need. So when he says, I am, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth and the life. He's saying that I am, speaking of himself, I am God's answer to man's deepest need. Well, that man's deepest need is reconciliation to the Heavenly Father. In these statements, I am, Jesus uses a familiar Old Testament way in which God himself identified himself. He is the eternal I am. And Jesus, in making these claims, is speaking in terms of how to know God. He's presenting himself as the way to know God the one through whom we can know God. He's presented himself as well as how one can be reconciled to God. What does Jesus claim for himself? He's claiming that he is the way to know God. He's claiming that he is the way to be reconciled to God. He's claiming that he is the way that God addresses man's empty soul. He is the answer to man's dissatisfaction and darkness. This is a statement in regards to who the Lord Jesus Christ is. What does Jesus claim for himself? First of all, 
He claims authenticity, authenticity, genuineness, as the only one who comes from God. He says that in our text again in verses 13 and 14. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. And they make a general statement that is accepted by all, and that is you can't bear witness of yourself. Notice Jesus' answer to that in verse 14. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record, specifically his record, is true. For I know whence I came and whether I go, but ye cannot tell whence I come and whether I go. Jesus designates himself as really the only way that there can be testimony to himself because he came from God. He says that back in chapter 5. This has been part of his teachings from the beginning. This is an emphatic claim by Christ. I am the light of the world. It's an emphatic claim. It's Jehovah's words in the Old Testament revelation. The I am. I am all that God is because I am God. I am one with the Father. I am all that you have anticipated as God's Messiah. I am the singular possibility that you have of knowing God. I am the one who comes from God, and I can take you to God. I am the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament symbolism, all of that Old Testament witness. I am the one to be believed, to be believed in. I am the solution to death and darkness, the solution to the hopelessness within. All of these are messianic claims. May I turn our attention back, please, to chapter 5. And now turning back to John chapter 5 and verses 16 and following. Well, this is a testimony that Jesus gave as they saw his life, as they were reacting to his messianic ministry. We'll pick up our reading now in verse number 17. John chapter 5 and verse 17. It's important to understand this because over in chapter 8, he's adding to this testimony. They're seeking to slay him, according to verse number 16, because he healed this man on the Sabbath day. Verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise." For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honored the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You notice in this paragraph that Jesus goes back and forth between Father and Son, He's claiming equality with the Father. He's claiming deity. He's claiming that what he is doing, the Father is doing, and what the Father is doing, he is doing. He's authenticating the reality of his Messiahship. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles has just been completed in John chapter number 8. During that time, there were four candelabras that were lit that really burned brightly throughout those feast days. They illuminated the city as a whole. Uh, it's recorded that every courtyard in Jerusalem would be reflected, illuminated 
uh, by these giant candelabras. There was singing and celebration in the court of women, which is simply the outer court where women as well could gather with the men to worship. And that celebration would go late into the night. At times, it's recorded they lasted all night long, and sometimes there were thousands of candles that were lit throughout the outer court. So when we think about Jesus declaring himself to be the light of the world, we're thinking, uh, according to the record as we see it, that the Feast of Tabernacles was now over. And now Jesus goes back to the temple, goes back to the outer court and begins to teach again. And he picks up on the celebration that has just taken, taken place. And just like in chapter six, he claims to be the bread of life. And in chapter seven, he claims to be the living water, the water of life. Now he claims to be the light of the world. As the bread of life, chapter six, there is spiritual sustenance. As the water of light, life, there is spiritual refreshment in chapter 7. Well, as the light of the world, there's spiritual illumination. So Jesus claims all three of these for himself, spiritual sustenance, spiritual refreshment, and spiritual illumination. All that was anticipated by Israel, by these chosen people of God, is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The manna, by which God fed them, by which Jehovah covenant God fed them in the Old Testament. Jesus presents himself as the bread of life. That water that came from the rock that provided water for all of those people and all of their animals, that multitude of people in the Old Testament is celebrated at the Feast of Tabernacles as they pour that water out each day. Well, Jesus in that setting presents himself as the spiritual refreshment, the spiritual water that these people need. And now is the light of the world. Jesus reflects back on what they have just celebrated, that pillar of fire that led them through the wilderness wanderings. Jesus is claiming authenticity as the only way, as the only one who comes from God. He speaks as God. This was an exciting time for God's people, Israel. But it was also a time that was disappointing because it was earthbound. It was a celebration that they were involved in year in and year out. And yet the reality of it had not taken place in their lives. And now Jesus presents himself as the reality of what has just been celebrated. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 5, John's first epistle, we read, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. As Christ stands before them, God is standing before them, speaking and ministering, incarnate God, authentic God, genuine God. We raise this question, what is the Old Testament witness regarding light? If Jesus picks up this Old Testament witness and applies it to himself, what would be in the mind of a student of the Old Testament? When we talk of light, what are we speaking of? I would suggest that we are, first of all, speaking of the earliest self-expression of God in creation. To speak of light is to speak of the earliest self-expression of God in creation. In chapter 1 of Genesis, in the beginning, at the origin of things, it says in verse 2, now darkness was upon the face of the deep. And you'll remember that in the very next verse, we read these words, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Verse 4 says, and God saw the light that it was good. The very earliest testimony of the creative work of God, which was how God originally put his glory on display is a testimony of light, of darkness penetrating light. The earliest self-expression of God in creation is what is thought about when we think about light. We go further, now moving into the second book of the Old Testament, and we recognize that light is not only the earliest self-expression of God, but it is the redemptive presence of God among his people. 
In Exodus chapters 13 and 14, as he leads Israel out of Egypt, as he protects the Israelites from the Egyptians, as he guides the Israelites to the promised land, he does so through a pillar of fire at night. It penetrates the darkness. It is what we know to be Shekinah glory. It is the testimony to God's presence and God's guidance. Let's take just a moment to turn to the second book of the Old Testament. Exodus chapter number 13. The second book of the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 13. And you and I know that to be that text that celebrates and records the narrative or the history of the redemption of God's people from Egyptian bondage. Chapter number 13 of Exodus, follow down, if you would, to verse number 20. Verse 20. Exodus 13, 20. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham, in the edge of the wilderness. Listen, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. Verse 22, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Well, this is the testimony of God's presence with his people, God's guidance of his people, God's protection of of his people. Following in the next chapter, chapter 14 of Exodus, look down at two verses with me, verse number 19 and verse number 20. Exodus 14, 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians, that is the enemy, and the camp of Israel, God's people. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, that is to the enemy, the Egyptians. But it gave light by night to these, that is the camp of Israel, so that the one came not near the other all the night. Here we have it again, a testimony of God's guidance, God's presence, but also God's protection. Follow down in verses 23 and 24. This is Exodus 14, verses 23 and 24. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. We have a testimony here as to what this light involved in Israel's history. It involved God's presence. It in involved God's guidance. It involved God's protection. As Jesus stands or sits before the people in the outer court and teaches them, he makes a declaration that he is the light of the world. What would be in the mind of the people who heard this? Well, they would have to think about the Genesis account, that this is a testimony of the glory of Jehovah. God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's the first testimony in the scriptures of the glory of God on display. They would be thinking as well of that pillar of fire that led God's people. It stood between the enemy and God's people. It guided God's people. It protected God's people. It was part of God's saving provision for his people. And Jesus stands there and says, I am the light of the world. I am God's presence with you. I am God's guidance for you. I am God's protection over you. We remember that when they built the tabernacle, the glory of God descended on the tabernacle in Exodus chapter number 40. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. 
So as they journeyed, as they moved from place to place, the glory of the Lord, the light of the Lord dwelt in the tabernacle. Again, God's presence with them. In 1 Kings chapter 8, 1 Kings chapter 8, we'll see about, uh, we'll see the testimony of the glory of God, the light of God descending upon the temple. You remember Solomon was used of God to build that temple. And the testimony is in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. And here's what we're talking about. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. So when we're thinking about the light of the world and we're hearing Jesus make this statement, He's doing so to make some connections for God's people Israel. He's reaching back to that creation narrative and communicating that he is standing before them, sitting before them. He is the glory of God on display. Let there be light, and there was light. He's also the redemptive presence of God among his people. What God did in leading Israel out of Egyptian bondage, that's what Christ was here to do. He was here to lead men out of bondage. He is the authentic Messiah. He is the promised one of the Old Testament. He is the one to whom all of these things pointed. He is the testimony of God standing before men. How does this fit with what John has recorded so far? Let's make our way back to John chapter 1. John chapter number 1. I want to read the first five verses of that prologue. Because were we to read straight through the Gospel of John, we would have read these words just a few moments before we came to the words in chapter number 8. So let's reconnect these things. I'm in John chapter 1. I just want to read the first five verses at this point. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So here we have a testimony of who this Lagos, who this Word is. This is the Word of God from eternity. Face to face with God, equal with God, actually God, and with God, verse number two says. Verse number three says, He is, Jesus Christ is the Creator. When He's revealed in John's Gospel, He reaches back again to Genesis chapter one. Let there be light. It says Jesus did this. Verse number three, all things were made by him. See, creation is attributed not only to the Father, but to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. To emphasize this, John says in the second part of verse number three, and without him was not anything made that was made. The testimony that John has already given us is nothing ever comes into existence apart from the word. And the Word has been revealed as the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. Now, notice it in verse 4, in him was life. And then this statement, and the life was the light of men. There's our phrase. Verse 5 says, the light, which is the light of men, the light of the world, shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. It goes on to say there was a man, verse number six, sent from God, whose name was John. We know that to be John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of what? The light. Why? So that all men through him might believe. John himself, it says in verse eight, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was, speaking of Christ, the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him. Takes us all the way back again. And the world knew him not. He came into his own, referring to Israel, the chosen people. His own received him not. 
verse 12 brings it together, but as many as received him, that is this life, that is this light, that is this logos, this word of God, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Is this not, is Jesus not the glory of God on display? John says he is. Is this not the goodness of God communicated? Is this not God stooping to give light to everyone, bringing, inviting those that see Christ, those that hear Christ, those that watch his works and listen to his words, inviting them to believe? So what does Jesus here claim for himself when he says, I am the light of the world? He claims, first of all, authenticity as the only one who comes from God. But you heard it as I read it, not only in chapter 8, but in chapter 5. He claims authority. Authority. They question his witness. And he says, I'm not a witness like your witness. I'm actually the only one that could bear witness because I came from him. Authority as the only one who is God and speaks for God. These Hebrews, these Israelites, would take up Psalm 27 as their praise and worship to God. Listen to Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Familiar, sung by the people of God. They were singing, Jehovah is the source of illumination. He is light. He is the source of salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation is a statement, a worship statement regarding the way back to God, the way forward with God. And Jesus stands and says, I am that light. Psalm 119, 105 is familiar to us. We read there, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Again, the word is the self-expression of God, the self-revelation of God. Jesus is presented in John 1 as the Word, as the Logos, as God on display. God on display in glory and guidance. Ezekiel chapter 1, we see the brightness of God's glory in that prophet's visions. That's an intense, consuming holiness. An intense, consuming holiness, but it's as well a darkness penetrating hope that's offered to God's people. There's a burning fire of intense brightness. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He speaks with authority as the only one who is God and speaks for God. In Psalm 44 and verse number three, we read the light of thy countenance and thy right hand and thine arm. In that Psalm, Israel celebrates God in action, delivering his people leading them into the land of promise, overwhelming and uprooting their enemies, settling his people into that land that he had provided for them. Here's the testimony of Scripture. And Jesus says, I am that one. This light is anticipated. This Messiah is anticipated. In Isaiah chapter number 60, it speaks of a day where the light will be God himself. And Revelation 21, 23, and 24 tells us that there will be no need for a son in heaven because of God's presence there. And here Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The feast is over. There is a nagging need in the hearts of those that are honest. And Jesus' messianic ministry continues as he picks up on the things they've just celebrated and says, I am the light of the world. He is the life-giving word from God. What does Jesus mean by this claim for himself? What does he mean? What does he claim? We've answered that. He claims authenticity as the only one who comes from God. He claims authority as the only one who is God and can actually speak for God. But what does Jesus mean by this claim for himself? Well, we understand that darkness fills the earth due to the fall and that 
light is needed. So when he says, I am the light of the world, well, what are we talking about? We're talking about the world. We're talking about moral and spiritual darkness. We're talking about a place that's filled with death. When we talk about the world, we're also talking about a place filled with man-oriented solutions. After 6,000 years of human history, Jesus comes on to the scene and gives testimony that he is the, the darkness penetrating light of the world. What is he claiming for himself? First of all, he's claiming that he is the fundamental source of the world's illumination. As we've said, he is claiming deity. He's claiming messiahship. To have him is to have light, he says. Uh, apart from him, there is no light. He is the one who illuminates the true nature of God. And he is the one who exposes the true nature of man. As this light is shining in the darkness in Jesus' day, these religionists are irritated. Darkness is coming to the surface as they have determined to take his life. He illuminates the spiritual darkness. He gives testimony to the truth of the nature of God and exposes the truth regarding the nature of man. He exposes the blindness of man. He exposes his endless search. He exposes this self-affirming claim of the religionists who sit be or who stand before him. These guesses that they are making about how a man can come back to God. He's saying light only comes one way, and that is through him. He's claiming that the prophecies are a testimony to him, that the incarnation is the testimony to his godhood, that his life and ministry is a testimony to light, that his cross-bearing his death on the cross and his resurrection and his ascension and his coming through the ministry of the Spirit at Pentecost will be testimony of the fact that he is the fundamental source of worlds of the world's illumination. I am the light of the world. Secondly, he alone can penetrate the darkness of the world and Satan. See, man doesn't have light in himself apart from Christ. There is a conscience witness, the scripture teaches us, about the morals, right and wrong. There is a marred image-bearing sense of God in the soul of man. But apart from Jesus, man lives in darkness. Jesus claims that he is shining in the darkness. It's incomprehensible. Man cannot comprehend it, but it's also inextinguishable never discoverable through man's own search. Rather, it's revealed through God's initiative in the person of Jesus Christ. The claim is that Jesus is the truth and the revelation of God. He's light shining as the sun. He is exposing the reality that man is dead in his trespasses and sin. He is testing to the reality that only God brings light, and that comes through the shining out of his son. So we have the celebration, the illumination, and the anticipation of this Feast of the Tabernacles. All of history has awaited this personal visitation from God. And Jesus, in the midst of that, says, I am the light of the world. I am deity penetrating darkness. Authenticity, authority, the fundamental source of the world's illumination and the one alone who penetrates the darkness of the world and Satan. Are there false lights? Well, no doubt. Those 6,000 years of man's history, when we think about false lights, we think about man's reason, man's attempt through his own thinking to come to the truth, man's own philosophies, man's passions, his earnestness, False lights, liberalism, false light, idolatry, the idea of our day, this voice within, false light. 
accumulation of knowledge and pleasure and relationships and possessions and accomplishments. Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, it's all empty. There's no light there. So what does Jesus claim for himself? He claims authenticity and authority. What does Jesus mean by this claim for himself? Well, he is communicating that he is the one who illuminates, who puts God on display, who penetrates the darkness. He's opening himself, offering himself as an opportunity to come into the light. There's more in John 8 and verse number 12, to which I'd like now to give our attention the second part of that verse. We're in John chapter 8 and verse number 12, and we're following the statement of Christ in this verse. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Now look, listen to the second part of the verse. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The light which comes from him who is life. The light of of life is the light which comes from him who is life. It is the light which is itself life. It is the light which results in life. Listen again. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. What is he saying? He's saying he that the light which comes from him who is life the light which is itself life, and the light which results in life. So we ask this third question of this passage. What is Jesus offering with his claim? What is he offering with his claim? Go back with me to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah and chapter number 42. We've learned that Jesus reaches back into the Old Testament. All that has foreshadowed him. We have learned that this connection with the Old Testament is what he expects the Jews to make, particularly these Pharisees and scribes who spent their time studying the scriptures should have these things before them. So when he uses a phrase like the light of the world, that should take their mind somewhere. We have already referred to the creation narrative and the redemptive narrative and also the prophetic narrative that anticipates a Messiah. Well, let's see it a little further in Isaiah 42 and verse number one. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. So here's a testimony of the coming Messiah. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walketh therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand, and will keep thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. The coming of the Messiah would be to penetrate the darkness with light. The people of God, Israel, were intended to bear that light, to be testimonies to that light that addresses man's brokenness, that addresses man's great need. Go to chapter 49, just down in verse number six. One verse in chapter number 49 of Isaiah's prophecy concerning the servant of Jehovah, the Messiah. 49.6, and he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, 
that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. See, these Jews were part of the people of God. They were part of the children of Israel. They were part of the people who not only were to embrace this light, this Messiah, this suffering servant, but they were to take the light that brings salvation to the other nations. Let me show you one more in Isaiah chapter number 60, the first three verses. What's in the background? What's in the mind of these religious teachers as they hear the Lord Jesus Christ declare himself to be the light of the world? Well, there's this future glory that they're anticipating. That's, the, that's part of what they're celebrating at the Feast of Tabernacles. They're looking back to redemptive history. They're looking forward to the anticipation of the coming Messiah. And Jesus is standing in front of them saying, I'm here. This is who I am. Verse number one of Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, a gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Jesus displaying the glory of God to God's people, the children of Israel, who are prepared by God and intended by God to be a light to the Gentiles, to the other nations. This one will be sent to fix everything that's broken. This one will serve man's greatest need. God's saving mission, Isaiah's presenting, will come through his suffering servant and, by extension, through his chosen people. So when he says, you are the light of the world, he says, you are to be those reflecting the light of the Messiah. And when he says, I am the light of the world, and cause them to follow him. He says, if you do, you will not walk in darkness. You will come to the understanding of all that God has promised, and you will have the light of life in you, the light which results in life. He that followeth me, he says, whoever follows me, it's a most reasonable invitation. It's a call to believe. It's an invitation to commit oneself wholly and entirely to him as Savior and Lord. To follow him is a testimony of full surrender and submission to him. As Jesus teaches, and these religionists are listening in and are really rejecting him and refusing to bow to him, he continues to invite them to trust him, to embrace him, that he is everything that God has promised. He says, if you will, you will never walk in darkness. See, all of that religious system had been twisted and turned to be a man-centered effort to gain favor with God. And it's described in terms of darkness. It's a groping ignorance. You're trying to gain God's favor and you're living in uncertainty and you're laying this burden on the people of Israel. And this light is shining in the darkness. And you will not be able to extinguish this, he's saying to them. You're not comprehending it, but you won't be able to extinguish it. This is available to the world. This is available to whosoever believeth. Let's take just a moment to look at Jesus' ministry to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is another reference to this light that has already come before when we make our way to John chapter number 8 and verse 12. Look with me at John 3. Known as the gospel in a nutshell is verse number 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice now the explanation, verse 19. This is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil, listen, hateth the light 
neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. That light would penetrate that darkness, expose that darkness. But verse 21 says, he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. This light is avoided by all who are unwilling to address their need because it exposes the darkness. Let me look at one more text with you in John's gospel, a text we'll get to in the coming months, and that's chapter number 12. Turn over, if you would, to John chapter 12, and we'll pick up two verses here. Jesus is standing before them saying, I am the light of the world. He has other things to say and has things that he's already said. Verse 35 of John 12, we read, then Jesus said unto them, yet a little while is the light, speaking of himself, with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you, for he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. A genuine offer. A genuine offer directly to them from the offended Holy Father. I am the light of the world. So what is Jesus offering with this claim? He's offering to dispel the darkness for all who will follow him. What is the darkness? The darkness is a result of the fall. And Jesus is saying, I will dispel that darkness. He's calling his hearers to a genuine trust in him. He is addressing the darkness that's part of every soul. And he's saying there's only one solution and I am that solution. He's addressing the blindness of spiritual death and presents himself as God's only answer. There's one answer to that darkness. There's one answer to that death of the fall, and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. What does the light involve? Well, it involves revealing God to man. It involves reconciling man to God. What does that light involve? It involves satisfying God's requirements paying for man's rebellion. All of this is in the shadow of the cross, the upcoming cross in just a few months. This light communicates forgiveness, grants spiritual life. It says, they'll never walk in darkness. The last part of verse number 12 of John 8, but shall have the light of life. <clears throat> that would be blasphemy coming from anybody other than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only through an intimate knowledge of God that anyone could issue such an invitation and make such a promise. I am the light of life. I am spiritual life. I am living light. I am hope. I will dispel the darkness for all who will follow me. And secondly, I will bring you to spiritual life where no darkness exists. I will bring you to spiritual life where no darkness exists. This unfailing light throughout life and into eternity, unfading, unending, never fading or failing in circumstance or situation. I will be that light. I will guide you. I'll be that life, that spiritual life to you. I will guide you. I will protect you. I will direct you. You can walk in the light instead of walking in darkness. What is the offer from the Lord Jesus Christ? He offers himself as the light of the world. What is the invitation? The invitation is believe and follow and live blessed. The testimony is that Jesus is everything that God is. He is God visiting man. And he is the light of life. He is the life of God offered to man. And he promises if you will believe him, you will trust him, you will embrace him, you will actively follow after him, you will not walk in darkness. He is the light of eternity that leads us into eternity. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the testimony of the words and works of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will trust you to take this truth Bring it home to our hearts and our lives. We will trust you to help us as we understand those of us that are believing that Jesus is the light of the world, but that he has called us to be lights 
in this world and that his glory is to be on display in our lives. His grace, his goodness is to be on display. We are on that mission of communicating that light, that darkness penetrating light, that life that comes only in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. May our souls be encouraged. May those that are not trusting you come to faith, come to believe, come to trust the testimony of you yourself in the person of the incarnate Christ, our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer, our only hope. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.